afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to my Revnet colleagues, and thank you also for my various partners in crime who have been attending the annual dialogue on women, peace, and security from the civil society side. So there's a, a wonderful group of people in this audience who are sitting in a university house drawing room writing a shadow report uh, to government on the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan, um, along with Sharon Bagman Rolls from Fiji, who was our keynote speaker at the Gender Institute last night. So that's why the room is fuller than normal. <laughs> but thank you all so much for my room there, for coming along. All right, so to get to it, um, and I suppose that's what drives this presentation. It is, it's, tr it's an academic exercise, but it's also really trying to brainstorm, and with all of you in the room, what should Australia do in September? So um, the main argument is that we should be progressing the Women, Peace and Security agenda as much as we can during our presidency in September, along with the whole term that we're, we're in there. And why should we do that? Because we said we would, and it's in all our materials. I'm going to make a promissory estoppel argument to do that. Uh, but also, I believe the how is really important. And the how is something that I'm sure Deep had are thinking about very hard now. And it's a very interesting exercise to which I think there's no exactly right answer, but I've come up with as many options as I can. And the framework for judging which option we should take, I think, is this one, nation branding. So in other words, living up to the claims we made in our campaign and our general foreign policy uh, branding, which is we're a smart middle power with all these particular types of attributes for practical work problem solving, etc. Um, our current foreign policy objectives uh, and, and our comparative advantage. This takes into account the actual reality of the amount of resources we have to throw at our September presidency. And also, what cutting edge issue that could address the agenda are we best meshes with what we can provide? So this is what we're going to have a look at. Now, the, the scope of the talk will explain the research context, why we're in peace and security, uh, why now, which is a very important question, what are the current blockages, what we should do, uh, how we should do it, and then I've got three options. And I want you to all vote with whatever you want to vote with at the end about which option you should pursue. So just very quickly, I'm part of the Security account, the Security Council Analysis Network, along with my colleagues Jeremy and Hilary, who are in the room, and Murray Ev, who I think is in the room. And, oh yes, yes, she is. So the Security Council Analysis Network, which also uh, comprises Jenny Whalen and Chris Markson from UNSW. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and I'm also a member of the Women, Peace and Security Academic Collection along with quite a few academics in this room. Uh, so we, the overall research context is the idea that the Security Council is important, Australian leadership at the Security Council is important, and how we're going to evaluate in an academic way what, what that leadership is consistent of at the end of the term and during. I just like that photo. <laughs> Winners. All right. Uh, <laughs> I won't tell you too much about the Security Council, except just to focus, because I want to use this button. Uh, the maintenance of international peace and security and the existence of a threat. So this will, this will come very important in a, in a little while. I'll explain that one of the issues that bedevils the Security Council is the whole area of conflict prevention, which I think has been one of the issues in the peace and security agenda. All right, that is a picture of, um, let me get this right, Zainab Hawa Bangura, who is the Special Representative to the Secretary General of Sexual Violence in Conflict. And there's been a whole range of architecture that has emerged since the Security Council Resolution 1325. It's actually a cluster of resolutions, these ones. Um, and the essence of it, uh, I won't go too much into detail about the content of it, but the essence of it is that first, there's a differential experience of conflict that needs to be recognised. Second, that, they, that women and girls have an essential role in those areas that are crucial to the Security Council's overall mandate. Um, and also, quite a few of the later ones where Hillary Clinton had a big uh, impact are about impunity for um, sexual violence in conflict. So it is groundbreaking, uh, but one of the main issues of 1325, the only thing you have to actually do is to get yourself a national action plan. Um, so each country is meant to have a national action plan. Here's Australia's, which is a year old, uh, but there's only 40 of them. And it's just binding. Security Council resolutions are binding, so every member of the United Nations has been followed. 
So I think that's a clear right there. Only 40 countries have got a national action plan and of those only a handful are funded in any meaningful way. Um, and we don't have any baselines much. Uh, so it took until I think the 2009 resolution for the Secretary General to have a role in actually monitoring the uh, implementation of the resolution. Now there's been a lot of uh, sound and fury in the Security Council around the thematic agenda. So Women, Peace and Security is known as a thematic agenda item, along with things like children and armed conflict um, and uh, uh, peace building and various other ones, as opposed to country-based uh, resolutions. So there's been some analysis that while the Women, Peace and Security agenda is sort of infiltrating the country resolutions, the thematic resolutions of the last couple of years have been very contested and fiery and there's this sense that the thematic agendas have gone too far, uh, that they are overreaching the mandate, and that in fact only countries and only issues which are currently the subject of Security Council interventions should be on the agenda. So the most obvious example of this is where the, Security, the Secretary General's report talked about electoral violence and sexual violence occurring in an electoral context, and that was heavily objected to by countries like China, Russia, and, uh, and others. So, and, and at the same time, those among you will know that the Commission on the Status of Women has been extremely contested in the last couple of years, and last year wasn't able to reach a final conclusion, but this year it was. We'll get to that. Um, these are the thematic areas of the Women, Peace and Security Resolution. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I would say, oh, they're all fairly underdone, but uh, <laughs> particularly underdone in the analysis of the Peace Women Collective and other academics is the participation. Um, all right, so here we go, Australia's turn. Now, we had a campaign, it's got a big kangaroo on it, it's beautiful, uh, but in there it says, we have a, been a constant champion of the Women, Peace and Security agenda, and that is true. Every time there has been a vote, anything to do with the peace, Women, Peace and Security agenda in the past, um, Australia has always been supportive, but of course we've never been a member of the Security Council the last 20 odd years. Um, we, the other factor we need to take into account is that DFAT has limited resources and they're probably about to get more limited. Um, they do have specific resources for the Security Council term though. Uh, the opportunities, we are the pen holder in Afghanistan, which I have now, which was a term that bedeviled me somewhat, but it means that we are the main point of contact and that we draft, we're the key drafter on resolutions. So we're the Afghanistan pen holder in the um, Security Council. Uh, Gary Quinlan sits on the Iraq Sanctions Committee and we will have two one-month terms of president during our two years on the council. What The first one is in September 2013 and there'll be another one in 2014 with a date not yet set. Um, the story so far, the major thing we have done has been a major speech by Bob Carr on Afghanistan um, last month and uh, we have also been active in uh, various resolutions on North Korea and Syria and uh, we've made statements about Syria, um, particularly about chemical weapons and access to medical care, uh, health emergencies. So this website down here is always gives you exactly what's going on at any one time and it's really well worth bookmarking and having a look at what we're saying and who's saying it. So. So why, why Women, Peace and Security and why now? I think it's a really good time. At the moment there's the Rwanda presidency. Rwanda obviously has <coughs> huge moral cred when it comes to speaking the Security Council about conflict prevention and sexual violence in conflict. And it's using its presidency to talk about both those things. So as we speak, they are talking about conflict prevention in Africa. And in, uh, next week they'll be talking about the Secretary General's latest report on sexual violence in conflict. So that's happening. We also know in June the UK presidency is going to very much focus on women, peace and security because they've just made this big G8 splash um, at the foreign minister's meeting, uh, which was about no amnesty, no uh, basically stopping impunity for sexual violence in our conflict, but also some resourcing. And particularly they unveiled a 70 team expert group, um, 70 member team expert group for deployments. Um, and quite a lot of money. So the G8, we know the UK is going to make a splash in its presidency. Uh, we also uh, have a, a new cross-cutting report which basically points out in great detail 
uh, by, the, by the major monitor of the Security Council called the Security Council Reporter, which talks about the progress and lack of progress that's made. And this year it's focused very much on the sanctions regime and using the sanctions regime to, to combat sexual violence perpetrators. Uh, and we just have out the latest Secretary General's report on sexual violence and conflict. Australia, um, Auspice, along with Norway, I believe, uh, a conference in Wilton Park focused on the Secretary General's report on women in peace building lately. Uh, and the uh, Security Council announced a DRC intervention brigade for the first time, and that was partly um, based on the incredibly sad reports of ongoing sexual violence for years and years and years and years. So that was within the Security Council, outside, as I mentioned, the G8 uh, efforts. We know that India and South Africa have been getting what's called normalised foreign policy reporting about sexual violence. So this is, I think, a new phenomenon. In other words, sexual violence in India is reported as a high-level foreign policy issue, talking about the impact on their GDP and their, and their foreign policy. Uh, the Commission on the Status of Women recently met on violence against women and got a successful outcome. But also the head of UN Women at that time, Michelle Bachelet, said she was stepping down to go back to Chile. So sort of a positive and minus winner Hillary Clinton has also moved on from her Secretary of State role. Uh, they have established a team of experts on sexual violence and conflict. Um, and the, uh, we have this architecture, so we have UN Women, we have the new Sexual Violence and Conflict Special Rapporteur, we have the UN Action to End Violence Against Women, so we have some new architecture that's quite recent. Uh, and when you have a new NATO envoy on gender equality, and we have the Great Lakes Declaration in Africa. So since in the last two years, there's been an enormous amount of work happening on gender violence and gender equity in the international, at the hard end, the hard end of the foreign policy. So that's the kind of the context. So why now, I believe, because there's an actual political opportunity where there might not have been in the past. But there's a lot of blockages to this progress. And not least, uh, so there's some, some step forward. So in other words, uh, the Security Council Monitor has said, even though the thematic debates have stalled, we are getting good language in country mandates, and maybe that's the most important thing. So they're pointing to uh, the uh, where is it? MT3, the DRC, the and also the um, oh, well, most of the mandate missions. But Guinea-Bissau and Syria have had no positive language on the women, peace and security agenda. And there's also been some uh, expansion of the work in sanctions and committee at committee level, but no no correlation between the work of the Special Rapporteur on Sexual Violence and Conflict and the work of the Sanctions Committee. So the analysis of the Security Council report has been the sexual violence work of the Security Council is sharper, but everything else um, is inconsistent, I suppose would be the message. And then there's been this massive pushback in the thematic debates that I referred to. The, Sec the Secretary General's latest report in 2012, which I had in the fly for this talk, basically talks about the participation representation in peace talks is still parlous. So 16% since 1990, uh, since 2000, I think it was. We had a press release for the event yesterday. Only 16% of peace agreements have mentioned women, been signed by women, had any context of gender women at all, and yet this is still seen as perfectly okay. So the peace agreement piece, this, despite some really amazing work, uh, has not progressed. Uh, and these protection gaps ideas, um, in other words, on the front line, sexual violence against women is still occurring and there being no access to resources or justice for those women. Um, and this one, which has been talked about increasingly, budgets, financing, the financing for women's empowerment and the women, peace and security agenda has really stalled. In terms of financing, actually, governments putting budgets around uh, their their obligations, it hasn't gone very well at all. Even though there were some very important meetings last year in the Security Council about this issue of finance. Um, the as I said, the report has just come out, and these are the key findings. Mm -hmm. So, this is the, the new area: sexual violence against men and boys, forced marriage, which is something Australia has been very active on lately. Um, the links between sexual violence and natural resource extraction. So you can see from the point of view of countries that don't like overreach in the thematic area, some of these issues are very close to the bone. 
um, and the correlation between sexual violence and inadequate security sector reform. Uh, and then there was some country-based uh, information over here that the Secretary General raised, and this one is probably very relevant to us about Timor Leste and also about Afghanistan. But they dropped a whole lot of countries, so they dropped Chad and Egypt, and they removed all all the information about sexual violence in the context of internal strife and elections, which is bad news for countries like Fiji, for example. All right, so in terms of the diplomatic possibilities, we have these various mechanisms. Well, the, at the top of the pyramid is a presidential statement. That means Australia could release a statement which is uh, agreed on by all the members of the Security Council and has quite a lot of weight as a consensus document. So that's that would be the best outcome we could have, is a presidential statement. Uh, we could have an area formula meeting, which is an informal type of mechanism that can move a debate forward, and that usually uses NGOs or academic experts to try to push an agenda item a little bit further outside or in the corridors of the Security Council. And the best example of that recently was, uh, and she came to the ANU to talk about it, was Rachel Kite from the World Bank talking about climate change as a security issue. Uh, should be coming under the mandate of the Security Council, something like that. And there's been a lot of area formula meetings about the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And in fact, that's how we got the Women, Peace and Security agenda, there's lots of area formula meetings. There's also country debates. Now, um, Security Council, of course, is a crisis management mechanism primarily. So the Australian presidency could be completely taken up with North Korea or Syria, depending on what happens uh, during that month. So if there is a country focus for the month of our presidency, what would we do in that context to um, to focus on the peace and security agenda? There's also a diplomatic, this is completely informal, a diplomatic uh, process called fireside chat. So this is just completely informal, informally, Australia using its good offices to bring particular countries together or particular uh, leaders from particular places to have an informal discussion to unblock some of the blockages, for example. Um, and then there's good old fashioned side events. Um, so this is where a country might use a sort of second track diplomacy or, or just basically bring, um, bring things uh, up uh, to the notice of other Security Council countries without any obligation for them having to attend. Uh, and uh, basically it's a way of airing a new and edgy kind of issue. So here are the options I have. Obviously I'm a transitional justice scholar, so I put that first. But I actually think it's probably the least likely. Uh, but I do think transitional justice is a very understand area of the Security Council. Uh, Multidimensional peacekeeping is the, the new black in the Security Council. Um, but if this could include the new use of gender advisors and mediators. It's very important to get more female mediators and more gender advisors. Uh, this has already been uh, highlighted in a meeting last year by um, Norway, I believe, but we could do more on financing women's organisations under the participation pillar. Maybe we could focus on our region, for example. With this one, uh, as I'll explain, I think it's the favourite. Strategies for holding gains in women's rights after military drawdowns, particularly if there's real issues in security sector reform. Um, and this is the one I believe I've found the best. Mm -hmm. Uh, protection of women advocates and organisations. So there was a really quite amazingly good uh, resolution from the Human Rights Council recently, which was about protection of human rights advocates, particularly those who receive external funding. Very important for Russia, but very important for a range of uh, organisations. And also important when it comes to mission drawdowns. How are we going to protect the women doing this women, peace and security work on the ground? What, you know, what about the front line? What are we going to do to help protect and support those women? Um, regional efforts to promote 1325, as I'll say, I think all our campaign materials said we would carry a brief for our region, we would, ca we would carry a brief for the Pacific, we would be an, an Asia Pacific voice. So that's something we could credibly do, and if you all could log to Sharon's talk, she would have told us a lot about the Pacific Regional National Action Plan. But it's also relevant to ASEAN. Developing and funding national action plans. If the key idea is for each country to have a national action plan in the, the first resolution in 2000, and we're in 2013 and we only have 40, maybe we should walk before we should run. The most important thing in all of international law, as you know, is domestic implementation.
representation. So maybe that's what we should focus on, actually getting every country to have a national action plan and to fund it properly and to implement it, including us. Okay? Um, and this issue of data, so we could focus on peace agreements, but we could, you could focus on anything. Yesterday, it really, really shocked me. We still don't have decent data on sexual violence in the DRC. We don't know. It's ridiculous when you think about it. Uh, so it's often the case in almost every conflict context I've ever studied is that you don't know the sexual violence in any degree of exactitude. So that is a really important issue. All right, so the recommendations. So if we look at my three criteria, nation branding, so in other words, in fact, our whole motto for the campaign was, we do what we say we will do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, this is quite an ominous sort of... Motto, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I don't know if that's always a good thing. But in our bid, we said, we will bring creativity, energy, and a practical problem-solving ethos. Uh, so, we, oh, I do think that is probably the character of Australia at the UN, the idea of, we get things done, we don't fuss about. Um, and we, we're quite, you know, we're a, a middle power who, you know, is neither fish nor fowl in many, you know, uh, international configurations, and we're part of WIOG, Western Europe, and other. Oh. Uh, so, 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 in some ways, that gives us a lot of freedom. It's the Pacific, so at least we have some someone to relate to. <laughs> so, well, that's right. The Pacific's also in that that category. So, we we are a bit of a freer agent. Um, so, you know, perhaps we can see ourselves as that broker in that broker role in some of these issues. So maybe we can talk to China about stopping some of its blockages around the World Peace and Security Agenda, for example, if we're brave enough. So that's one of my key recommendations, braveness and boldness. <laughs> uh, the second is, what are our current foreign policy objectives and comparative advantage? Uh, Secretary Peter Varghese told DFAT at the beginning of the year that they're, all they need to know, six plus two plus N. Uh, so that means the six primary countries of importance to us. Now let me remember them: <laughs> China, India, the US, Indonesia, and then there's two more: Korea and Japan, I believe, something like that. So six plus two. The two is the two organisations, that being East Asia Forum and the G20, and the N is the neighbourhood, right? So the six key bilateral relationships: those two forums and the neighbourhood. So anything we come up with, unless you want DFAT to suddenly sprout wings and work harder than they are, which I don't think is possible, is going to have to somehow align to what we're currently working on. And then these cutting edge issues. Um, yesterday, um, Paul Robiliard basically said, conflict prevention is the weakness of the Security Council. So um, he's the head of the Security Council Task Force, and um, he should know. So I thought that was quite important. And recently, Gary Quinlan, in a debate, said that protection of civilians uh, is the core of the Security Council's legitimacy. He said that should be our moral compass. So if, we, if we're basing our priorities on what we have said recently in the Security Council, they're two good ones, and, and ones that I certainly support. So, number one, we take a protection focus, we talk about drawdown strategies and SSR failures, and we look at Afghanistan and in two ways. And I don't think we could do any of these alone. I think we should um, work with other countries in all these strategies. I think that is the advantage we have, is that we can partner easily. So we should be partnering, but I think that one is a key one. Uh, it will affect Timor, it will affect Ramsey, it will affect Afghanistan, somewhere where we have skin in the game, if you will, as Defence would say. Um, so, and it's technical, but it's also very practical. I think we could add some value to that discussion, and I think it's an important discussion to have at that time, given what's going to be happening in Afghanistan, but it has much wider ramifications for other countries. Uh, and I think what that will highlight is this issue that the best conflict prevention mechanism is good peace building and reconstruction strategies. We know that conflict is cyclical. We know what happens in a cycle. We know that countries will experience conflict, who've experienced conflict before. We know the Security Council has these incredibly long in, uh, inter negotiations with countries once they have uh, intervened. So we should stop this sort of farcical when can the Security Council do things and not do things. Focus on where we do have 
an intervention window and make the best of it for conflict prevention purposes, at least. Uh, we could focus on the Asia Pacific. There, Rwanda is doing something on conflict prevention in Africa, as I've stated. I've had a look. I've never seen the Security Council take on conflict prevention in the Asia Pacific. Might be because China won't let it. I don't know. But it, uh, it does have this wonderful uh, synergy with ASEAN and the East Asia Forum, our Asian century focus, and in a very lateral way. It took me, I thought about this hard because it's my other academic area, the G20. There is not a lot of overlap, but one of the things that G20 talks about all the time is stability and economic stability. So one of the primary economic drivers of the world at the moment is the Asian region. If there is conflict in the Asian region, the whole world will suffer. So there is a there is a real issue here, and it might be a sideways way of looking at issues like the Korean Peninsula and the South China Sea. Uh, financing strategies. It doesn't sound as sexy, but it could be the most useful thing we do. So in other words, just raising money for frontline women. I think it's really important. Um, and how would we do that? Uh, and again, it's got to be something that you can show domestic practice, I think, to be really successful in the Security Council, the, the country seem to be able to Norway and Sweden are always very good at drawing on what they have done themselves and drawing out what other countries might be able to do. Um, so there might be things we can come up with from the defence reviews, for example. There might be all kinds of um, implementation and financing for implementation from a donor perspective. That would also, uh, this healthy economy point is, what does everyone say about Australia? We've got an amazingly healthy economy. It's part of our nation branding. Uh, it's also a G20 strategy. Why are we world leaders? Because we haven't fallen over like everybody else has in the budget space, right? Uh, the other thing uh, which was highlighted at the Wilton Park conference was trying to put some real political energy uh, underneath the seven point action plan on gender responsive peace building by the Secretary General that came out in 2010. And there's a, a, a series of ways we could do that, but again, that would be, I think, a practical and useful thing that we could do that Australia has a story to tell. So, Here's some key resources for you, but now it's your turn. I want votes. <laughs> I want to crowdsource the best idea. So I want a show of hands, please. This will be completely baffled with people watching on the webcam. Like, who likes the idea of protection, drawdown strategies, security sector reform? Do we only have to one? Uh, no, no, you can vote as many as you like. Who okay. likes that? Oh, that's a popular one. Yes, yes, okay, that is exceptionally popular. Who likes conflict prevention in the Asia Pacific? Who likes the debate abroad? Uh, yeah, quite a lot of yeah, people like that one. Who likes financing strategies? All the women's organisations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> yep, okay. And who likes gender responsive peace building? Yes, but not a zero point action. Oh, that's the secretary general. Yes, but not. Tell <laughs> the secretary. <laughs> that so that's, that's less popular, partly because it's a bit older, I think, but also it just hasn't been implemented at all, so it is a bit of a disgraceful enterprise. But anyway, if we get these right, we might have better gender responsive peace building. So I think the prize goes to number one. So I will talk to the Women's Peace and Security Activity Collective and we will write one of our hard hitting letters. <laughs> in the halls of the powerful. Uh, but you know, this is something where the Australian government needs, and whoever the Australian government might be when we uh, are president of the Security Council, which is something I've written an op-ed on if anyone's interested. It's a really difficult period for us uh, politically because there, there may be a change of government, but whatever happens, there'll be an election right in the middle of the presidency. So it's really important that Australia tries to choose something where there is bipartisan support, but also a high level of public support. And uh, it will need to have some sort of domestic legitimacy as well, or at least able to be explained to the domestic constituency. So I think, I, I do think most Australians get this, uh, most Australians understand that they're going to pull out of Afghanistan and that's going to be a very scary situation for those people. So um, that's probably got the highest media value. But, um, but now I would like to end there and say thank you very much. It's, fun voting for Security Council for a popular vote. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll put that to deep as well. <laughs> and now some questions. Yeah, so we've got at least half an hour for questions. Claire has got microphones, um, so... Um. OK, 
pretty loud. People don't know me. Um, um, thanks for that, Sue. That was great. I was just wondering, so what are the sort of next steps in regards to the credible strategies that exist to actually promote any of that agenda, and, and how do you see that working um, to actually get some action and response on, on those issues? It's very tightly held, these decisions, as, as you would expect, and they're also, I think, quite dynamic because what Australia does in its presidency in some ways is affected what, by what the countries immediately preceding it does. And also what countries have done in previous years, especially recent years. So I looked at all the different area forming meetings and all the different open debates from last year on peace and security and tried to come up with things that had an edge. You need to be at the edge the Security Council needs to kind of be at the forefront of some of these debates, um, which is possibly why things don't get implemented properly because everyone moves on to the next cool thing. Uh, but in terms of domestic channels, DFAT is holding a Security Council consultation with a massive group of people, as far as I can tell, in May. Um, there's a classic right to the Foreign Minister strategy, uh, which does work sometimes. So uh, if you've got brilliant ideas about what you want Australia to do in September, you should just write to them. And I'd probably write to Julie Bishop as well, just <laughs> uh, and uh, And there's also, you could also, um, uh, I think lobby the task force, uh, the Security Council task force, and also you could write to Ambassador Quinlan. Uh, but the, the big, the big picture issue will be a political decision. So it will be a political decision based on advice from the Security Council task force and the ambassador as to what Australia focuses on. And then after that, there'll be, I, I would think, <laughs> some sort of socialisation of the idea. But there might not be. I, I don't know. I mean, there hasn't been. Any socialization of what they've done so far. Thank you. Um, I'm Ayu from um, Annie, PhD. Uh, what about the uh, women in post-conflict? What, what uh, does it have space on, on, on that, the discussion on that? And also, um, in regards to the Australian National Action Plan, um, the issues on monitoring, I don't know, because I, I, I wasn't able to come yesterday in the, in, in the dialogue meeting. But I'm sure that's also the, the, the main uh, important issues uh, that needs to discuss. What's the role of civil society? And also specifically in terms of the strategy for, um, I think it's quite comprehensive um, in, 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 in its design. But how to implement it because we're dealing with, you know, like um, Indonesia, for example, um, the Australian government has political interest on West Papua issue, for example. So in terms of implementing the strategy for into that context for Indonesia, that must be very quite difficult, I imagine. So again, uh, in regards to this, the roles of civil society or the role of us here, how to engage it in an effective way and monitor it in, in a way um, today. Thanks. There's a whole new um, area of work called MARA, is the acronym that's used in the Security Council debates. And it stands for, you, you'd think it would stand for something useful, but it's, it's basically the monitoring of missions and how this monitoring and evaluation work of Security Council action. And it's called MARA, so if you search for that. And one of the issues that, uh, um, in the previous one, uh, this one, the idea of how do, we, how do we get more gender experts actually doing monitoring of Security Council actions and how to make that meaningful. That is a very re that's a very real debate, and that will be also increasingly important. I mean, it, some of the issues are more technical than others, but that again, we don't know. The Security Council often doesn't know what the reaction is of people in the community um, to its interventions. So that feedback loop, I think, would be quite important. So that that is certainly something that was on the agenda of the Security Council report. <coughs> um, and it's also the subject of a really good report, which I recommend from CARE, called From uh, Resolution to Reality, which came out about three, a uh, three-country study, um, inspired by the lack of any women at the Bonn conference, uh, other than CARE's initiative in trying to get the Afghan Women's Network to attend. But the idea that an NGO had to get some women to the Bonn conference, uh, for example. So highly focused on the participation pillar and some of the architecture around monitoring. Um, now, your second thing was the peace building 
Uh, so you were saying the peace building, the peace building plan, the ten point plan, or seven point plan, sorry, by the Secretary General, is quite comprehensive but very politically sensitive. You know, that was the second part. And I was referring to the um, Australian National Action Plan, the strategy for you know the, the international involvement um, for the women peace security. So our obligation is to try to include female peacekeepers, and when we are involved in the coordination of peace agreements to have women at the table. Um, we have a very bad record, like the Townsville Peace Agreement um, from Solomons, with, with no women at the table. But in terms of, you mean for West Papua, uh, it's only where Australia has got confirmed involvement, involvement. So it doesn't mean Australia has to go to Indonesia and say, you need to include women in the West Papua peace process, or you need to get a peace process and include West Papua women in it. It's not as proactive as that. So, um, does that answer your question? It's a, it's a, it, do, it doesn't say that Australia has to take a proactive response in, in doing anything in the region that would be outside its current foreign policy parameters. But what's the obligation of the Security Council then? Because, you know, if, if these things are still happening and nothing is mentioned about women in conflict, like in Papua yes. or in Asia, for example, post-conflict, because things are not finished when the peace agreement was signed. Yes. Because women in Asia are, you know, keep repressed, even worse. So what's the obligation then? Um, I mean, yes. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So the problem is, most, uh, most of the permanent five members will say that is outside the ambit of the Security Council because they don't represent threats to international peace and security. They, are, they represent threats to Indonesia's peace and security, but they don't threaten anybody else. And this is why all those that's why he was trying to highlight these issues, Secretary General, for example, and having no luck at all in the thematic debates about those issues because the countries were saying, that is outside our mandate. Basically, we have finished our involvement in those countries. We are not, or we're not engaged with those countries. And so we're not going to look at sexual violence in those situations, for example. And the Secretary General saying, well, you should, because they're part of the the, the wider idea of the, the scope of the Security Council under the Charter. So this is a very active debate that's happening. So, you know, removal of electoral violence. Well, look, that, to me, it seems a fairly um, intuitive idea that that could be represent a threat to peace and security, but it's true. It's probably an internal threat to peace and security. This comes back to this feminist idea of public-private violence, the type of violence that is recognised as important by the international community is the type of violence that could cause problems for um, greater powers. So the sovereignty wall around an issue protects a whole lot of violence against women. So this is the very real debate that's happening at the moment, which is why I think, I think the temptation would be for DFAT to say, Rwanda's all over it, the UK's all over it, we're gonna pull back from the women, peace and security agenda and do something utterly safe, like working methods. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something they should not do. <laughs> they should absolutely, if, if the debates from UK and Rwanda fail to get a result, and it's all the more reason, I think, for Australia to use its presidency to, to keep trying. Um, but that's absolutely exactly the type of problems that are happening. So for Arche and West Papua, because they've never been on the Security Council agenda, it's even harder. I was just wondering, um, in regards to the fact that seeing as Australia will have the presidency during the time that we have the national election, how much of this do you think will actually be possible? Um, and how much will that hamper our Australia's ability to really play a leadership role during that time? Well, I've read an op-ed that's called Home and Away, which basically says it's disastrous. It's disastrous! I'm very upset. September is an incredibly important month for us. We have the G20 in St. Petersburg, we have the Pacific Island Forum, and we have our presidency of the Security Council. And what you don't want in the middle of all of that is caretaker period, and in our case, the caretaker period is going to last for a long time um, after the bans are posted in July. And it means September is gold for a UN Security Council presidency because that's Leaders Week at the General Assembly. So if you were president of the Security Council in September, you can normally get these amazing uh, high level, Prime Minister level meetings to, to bolster whatever you want to get done. So we lost that, basically. <laughs> uh, as we pull out the point of I'm not sure if that's possible. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's really difficult and it, it puts a lot of pressure on uh, 
people like the ambassador like Harry Quinlan and also on DFAT to make sure there's certain caretaker conventions about things we can, can and can't do. We can make those decisions, offer lots of briefings to the coalition and it can proceed, absolutely. So they can do all of this. It will just won't involve the political leadership um, and often at the Security Council it's that political leadership. So we sent Bob Carr to deliver the speech on Afghanistan and that was very strategic because that's the most important role we have in the Security Council. We send our Foreign Minister, it elevates it, it sends a message. So we won't be able to do any of that. Um, I mean the Senate, some of the half the Senate won't be elected, so there are some senators who we could deploy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's fairly disastrous. <coughs> DFA would be well aware of this. So it's just all the more important to get the ducks lined up early. Hi, just um, one very short question to follow on from that and then one bigger question. Um, October is usually the month when there's um, some reporting on women linking to CSW. Um, does that, is that challenging um, given our September timing of the presidency? Um, and that's just a small question. My big question is, um, you mentioned in your talk that participation was one of the key, participation of women in peace processes is one of the key challenges of um, 1325 and one that not a lot of action has been taken on it but it wasn't one of your um, recommendations for further action. Why not? Just because, uh, well, okay, so to take the first question first, yeah, it is a problem, I thought about that. Uh, but there's so many aspects of the Women, Peace and Security agenda that we could easily do an aspect of that in September, following on from last October's report. Um, and I, I think that's fine. Um, and in, in fact, there's no law that says it has to be in October either. It's just when that's when the Secretary General's report comes out. So that's when the open debates are on the hill. But you know, there's no law about that. Um, in terms of the second question, it was because they just had a big meeting on women in peace agreements, um, to which Christine Bell's research was, was used. And yes, yeah, so they have just had a big meeting, like that, an ARI formula meeting and also an open debate. And, go very well. But that's, see, again, no, no reason why we can't do things that didn't work last time, but it means if we do that, we need to know why, what the political blockages were and work on them through our informal mechanisms before we attempt it again. But I would think that that will want to have something it can put its thumbprint on. But, um, who knows? We don't know memory, institutional memory of how these things went previously much because it was so long ago. Oh, it's all a fresh slate, which is exciting. Fresh slate, make a lot of mistakes flying. Hi, John here from Action Aid. Um, we're uh, another one of the agencies who are keen on seeing a um, one of these activities around Afghanistan um, and support the the, uh, the prevention quiet suggestion. Um, but on that, in, my question is about effectiveness um, of the suite of um, activities that you outlined. And including the OE formula, the presidential statement, etc. Um, do you have an analysis of where those uh, where those tactics have produced better results? Um, tracks, you know, where these side meetings or OE formula or presidential statements on, on thematic issues have occurred, and then what has happened through the Security Council consequent to those those meetings? And just on that to share in talking with um, a couple of people at my table at the event yesterday from Prime Minister and Cabinet in DFAT, they were, and I was talking to them about this, advocating for, for this particular, uh, for an event around um, Afghanistan, women's rights in Afghanistan, um, they were saying, oh, please do get um, a suggestion in soon, um, which I think is um, part of your um, advice, but also think about what might link into the next president presidential moment for Australia next year and that they're, they're thinking about a theme that they can develop over both presidencies. I mean that would make sense too. I mean it's incredibly difficult because of the rotating presidency to get some sort of coherence between the previous president and the one coming after you and your second presidency so that the debate actually builds. Um, and I mean that's the purpose of these thematic agendas really is to try and make sure you're actually building on something and, and it becomes a more proactive agenda, which I think is why it's challenging to states who would rather have the Security Council have a reactive agenda. And you see exactly the same dynamic at play in the G20 where there's this idea of the, the crisis cabinet versus the steering committee and that tension in the, in the government's role. So uh, 
That's why I think security sector reform is a good one, because a lot of sexual violence happens because we get security sector reform wrong. So, in other words, we have uh, badly trained police, nearly armed after a conflict, a neighbouring you know, this, you know, who, who are the, the actors most likely to, to be involved in the next round of conflict, and it's the people that we armed and trained in the last round of conflict. So, you know, I actually think it's not quite simplistic, but I think it has a strong conflict prevention aspect to it. So I think it's got to be broader than Afghanistan. I think the side event could be in Afghanistan, but I think the actual debate has to be broader than Afghanistan for that reason. Otherwise it will be, um, I think, too politicised and too difficult and too... And I don't think it serves our stated aim of being a small and middle country uh, champion in the Security Council particularly well. So I think we do have to look at a wider idea of security sector reform or transitions in small and medium countries. You know, the countries that the whole world's not staring at on a regular basis. And so I think it's really important to link that kind of advocacy or exactly that kind of action to our existing national action plan. Because yes. those commitments are already there by DFAT and every other agency that's there, particularly around um, the, the gender-based protection of sexual violence and also um, operational activities that the Australian government is currently involved in. So in regards to actually getting impact and actually getting work done, building that platform based on our current commitments in the National Action Plan is a way forward to then also build it up to, to UNSC, but also to trickle down to the actual operational sort of application of the, the sort of theory, I guess, too. So I think it's really important to use existing commitments because government doesn't do anything new without uh, you know, a piece of paper and it's saying it has to do this. So use that paper that we already have, that policy imperative we already have, to make them do it. That's the question of how do we define Australia's leadership in the Security Council? Is that that we drove a global debate forward or is it that we made Australia, what Australia does, better? And I've been really struggling with this, is that how should we, I mean, we as Australian citizens, judge Australia's term of the Security Council? Should it be that we, did global, we, we um, somehow contributed to global, global leadership on an issue, we progressed an issue a little bit further? Or should it be that Australia did something better domestically or in the region because of its membership of the Security Council? It's a tricky one, isn't it? We really want both and we want them to be linked. But uh, a lot of the domestic conversation in some ways is harder than the, the global leadership conversation. Especially because in reality, Australia has very little, I mean, in terms of peacekeepers on the ground, you know, if you want to talk about boots on the ground or, you know, funding of these um, projects in significant, you know, in countries that have significant need, Australia actually doesn't do very much really at all. So, so, Australia doesn't really do very much at all. We have very few peacekeepers on the ground. We have, you know, either police or military. Um, and it's quite difficult to kind of, I think, to, to kind of, boss around those countries that are contributing in those ways if we don't have our own house in order and if we're not putting our own resources behind that. So. I think that might be true at the moment, but if you look at the campaign, yeah. we make a very large meal of our peacekeeping history. <laughs> There's a fantastic yeah. map of our <laughs> we look like superhero. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think historically yeah. we have yeah. a track record, but yes, uh, in terms of current deployments, yes. Oh, sorry, just in front of you and then we'll pass the microphone. Hi Sue, thanks very much. Um, it might be a naive question and it's possibly been answered in the greater space of your dialogue, but in accepting that all of those conflict countries are different and women are not homogenous, but if this room was full of women from those countries, what would they be prioritising? Do we have a sense of that? Or is this all of us eco-gazing and creating stuff that's really very irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It takes us back to that great question over there about, you know, maybe we should focus on monitoring and evaluation so we know what we're going to say. I mean, there is very organised women's civil society in a lot of these countries where the Security Council has a mandate of operation. But for precisely the problem of women not being involved in the peace and security dialogue at high levels, we often don't know what they want. Um, both from, from my perspective, I was just really branding what the Timorese women talked about, and a lot of Timorese women were very distressed about when the UN left, what would happen. 
And we've had a lot of Afghan women coming through on various delegations saying exactly the same thing. So um, there's that kind of, from my lived experience, that was real to me. But we don't know enough. And I think um, the Pacific Regional Action Plan is a good indicator. Uh, we had the Pacific Island Forum leadership declaration about uh, gender equality recently. Uh, we've had, um, I think, I think a lot of the development agencies have very good links to local communities of which they're working with, but maybe not that link up to this elite political institution. So that would be a good exercise too. I presume, and this could be a very naive presumption on my part, that DFAT, through its embassies and all its bilateral negotiations, might have some sense of that. Um, and I'm hoping that with Penny Williams being the global ambassador, uh, Australian ambassador for women, really, she's getting a sense of that in her visits and things. But she's very recent, she's only been going 18 months, um, and it's women, peace, and security is one of her core issues that she talks about when she goes on visits. I think it would have a very nascent, very nascent, basic, um, and it would be when there's really well organised women's organisations, like Femlink. So we're in the absence of that very organised civil society, I don't know if we have clue. And that's precisely the point that I, I, I wouldn't want to presume. Uh, I know from Afghan women's organisations that it's very real to them, but I also think it's, it's this wider issue. Um, thanks. Oh, it's just me. Yeah. <laughs> um, just adding to sure that. Sure. <laughs> just adding to that. I think um, while there's a bit of sensitivity, obviously within. Um, the members of the Pacific Islands Forum um, and Australia's role there, um, particularly on the issue of conflict prevention. I think there's, there's a great opportunity for Australia being a member of the Security Council now, given that last September the forum leaders not only um, you know, agreed to carry on the work of the regional, made the commitment to the regional action plan, but also the conflict prevention human security framework. So, um, with all of that, whether there were ways in which that, that, sort, that sort of regional level commitment, sometimes I don't see at the international level um, within the UN Security Council. So statements are being made about Afghanistan and, and other areas of the world with due respect, but not about the situations within the Australia's big backyard, the, the Pacific Island countries. So whether building on, on the statement yesterday, a lot does need to be done at the Security Council around prevention. Yes. Maybe there's a real opportunity because Pacific Forum leaders have agreed to that, including the, the work on women, peace and security. Hillary would be in a better position to judge, but they don't tend to like the words human security at the Security Council, really, do they? That's very traditional security focus. But, but, but as we can see with the resource extraction and they're talking more and more about narcotic trades and um, militia gangs and you know all these types of actors outside traditional armed actors, it's, it's, it's starting to happen because in the country resolutions particularly, they're context driven and the context is that these aren't neat parcels of issues anymore. But the reaction to the climate change and security debate was, you know, oh, we can't possibly, oh, you know. And that, that's deeply depressing, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I like that. So so that's one idea. We could go back to DFAT and say, it's time to give the end a whole lot of cloud. Mm -hmm. Time to get put the neighbourhood right in the centre of the frame. Mm -hmm. And I like that because no one is ever going to talk about those issues at the Security mm -hmm. Council otherwise. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be the champion of small states, well, you know, why not mm -hmm. do that? I think, that's a, I think it's a good argument. The question is, will that be relevant enough? That will everyone come? And will everyone participate? I think so. No, small states in the world. Hilary, did you have a comment on the human security issue based on your research? In fact, you should take the opportunity to tell everyone what you want. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're exactly right. I think that the security council is so much on its plate that it spends its time triaging a lot of getting rid of um, getting rid of great deal of I mean, one suggestion too, I was just thinking of following on from the Security Council report last week, which had that special report that they did, which was fantastic. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Um, yes. Um, yes. Yes. Women, yes. Peace and Security was a wonderful resource. Yes. Yeah, this one, read that, it's awesome. Yeah, yes, it's really excellent. It's resulted in a huge amount of research in the country. But it just struck me that 
what they were talking, they were examining the 2011 stuff that the Security Council had done, which was, you know, despite all of this, that the Security Council so often itself isn't even following its own resolution. You know, so, so on, for example, inclusion of uh, women, peace, and security peace agreements. I think my memory is something like four out of the nine of that year um, that were broken to have that. And uh, also in, um, in involving women in peace negotiation. And the figures were, I think, perhaps three out of 11. So I'd like Australia just to say on our watch for, we'll, we'll, while we're on the Security Council, we'll try and get the Security Council to itself. The Security Council should do what it says it will do. Just a strange. And actually, that's right. I, they also said that um, you know the UN has a zero tolerance approach to sexual violation by its own peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that research basically said that that's not included, in fact, in the mandates of peacekeeping operations in over half of them. So its own policies are not being implemented by the Security Council itself. It's left to the, the uh, DPKO, which is, yes. The conflict prevention, um, it was Beck who asked about that, I should say, has been given to, partly given to UN Women and the Police Peace Building Support Office, both of which are the two organs of the UN which have the least amount of funding at the moment. So there's an absolute crisis funding, crisis in funding for what I call the prevention architecture. Um, it's really, it's absolutely shameful. So it's no wonder that it's an undercooked uh, um, the Security Council because there's no money given to it. Um, you know, it's the Peace Building Commission, which is the poor relation of the UN agency as well. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a good one. At least we could do that. Hi, Steph from Oxfam. Um, so, uh, notwithstanding the fact that working methods is really boring, um, I did have a question about, um, which really links to that question of what do women want, which is that, you know, kind of very impossible question to ever answer because we're not all the homogenous group and, and whatever, but still the, the point in that is where are the voices of people who are affected by conflict and violence and insecurity every day and how are they getting to the Security Council? So the ARIA formula briefing came about because of an ambassador who basically set up a meeting with a bunch of NGOs, including Roxfam, whenever it was, 10 years ago or longer. And that formula has led to, you know, it's expanded, NSF, Amnesty, you know, all of the big NGOs have ARIA formula briefings as well as academics, and that's led to pretty much the entire thematic, um, you know, explosion of thematic issues on the Security Council, which now, as you say, has led to integrating these new, improved approaches into the country resolutions. So that is Security Council reform, and it basically came down to one ambassador deciding to set up a meeting. So I guess my question is, can we not dis disregard working methods? Because working methods is kind of how this all happened. And I guess my question is, what could be the Quinlan method? <laughs> and yes. how could that engage the Quinlan more <laughs> with people affected by conflict? Because they're the people that we don't hear. Um, and that's one thing that ActionAid and Amnesty and Oxfam and anyone else who wants to participate we're trying to think out about basically how we can pitch an ARIA formula briefing with Afghan women, women human rights defenders and civil society representatives who are at the local level, not the INGOs, but actually, and that's happened with DRC, but Afghanistan is much more complex. But I guess is there some other mechanism that would be better for engaging those groups um, that we can be pitching to the Australian government if they're keen on working methods? Well, that's the thing. In fact, an ARIA formula meeting is sort of outside the official working methods. So it's not an official working method, actually. No, it is. It's captured, well, it's in, captured in the formula, but as an informal procedure. No, it's captured in a Security Council presidential statement as in a method statement. now. Yeah. It yes. is informal, but, but it's, it's... It's not in the manual, so... It's not in the manual. But it's actually the value of it has been captured in various presidential statements. And I think John asked before, you know, what's the value of doing those things? It's because you get them eventually on the agenda 10 years later, <laughs> if you try all these methods. But I, my instinct would be is that, in fact, area formula meetings are a step too far for most of the five in many respects, and they're often used by the Nordics and, and it used to be Canada in a very active way, but not a lot of the P5 members. So if we want to get that to be increased to a very local level, I think that would be tricky. 
that's certainly worth asking, the Quinion, Quinion formula. There's this absolute proliferation of groups of experts, GRE, in all these country situations, and there's also this absolute proliferation of um, Secretary General Special Representatives on various issues, of which the Sector of Violence and Conflict um, Ambassador is one. And the idea there is that they are meant to go and have civil society consultations in country. I think it's really important to have in country methods because I really think anything based in New York is going to be elite. I mean, I'm sorry, but no one goes to New York. Even, even the area formula means it's funny, fancy international NGOs never get participate in those. Only, you know, no, no, you know, no grassroots organisation works over to New York and <laughs> are regulating the rules and knows how to play that game. It's the, it's the big agencies who've got New York based offices, and that's all they do. Um, so, so those in-country consultation mechanisms, I think, are really important. Maybe that's something we could say that groups of experts appointed by um, the the Security Council should have to consult with civil society in country and they should make sure half of their consultation is other women and girls and you know something like that. Do you think? Well maybe we do both. Yeah. 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 See what yeah. sticks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to cut off the discussion there before we're actually throwing out of the field. Thank you so much, Sue, for really um, <laughs>